I thought I would make a bonus video going through all the uh, events and locations and people of this game because a lot of them were taken from real life. So let's start with the big event, the Salem Witch Trials. In the winter of 1692, a few young girls from Salem Village became ill. After examination, the local doctor determined the illness was from witchcraft. The story is often told with Tituba, the slave of Reverend Samuel Paris, telling stories about witchcraft to the girls as she looked after them. The girls are then believed to have practiced fortune-telling on their own. One story reflects that a girl saw the image of a coffin while trying to tell the identity of her future husband. Soon after this incident, the afflictions are said to have begun. Recent research, though, has revealed there is no evidence to support the storytelling by Tatuba or the fortune-telling session by the girls. However the event started, the girls eventually named three women as their tormentors. Tatuba was named as a witch along with two other women from the village, Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne. All three women were taken to Ingersoll's Tavern in Salem Village for questioning. Tatuba relented and admitted being a witch and even named others in the village. Inflammatory sermons by Reverend Paris helped to fuel the hysteria that eventually overtook Salem as people began to feel as though Satan was attacking them through their fellow villagers. In response to his daughter's afflictions, Thomas Putnam sought arrest warrants for those who he believed were causing the harm. The new governor, William Phipps, created the court of Oyer and Terminer to hear the cases of witchcraft and appointed the court's judges, including Samuel Seawall, John Hawthorne, and William Stockton. The first trial took place in early June, with Bridget Bishop being the first to be executed on June 10th. By the end of the trials, around 150 people had been accused of witchcraft. In total, there were at least 24 people who died, 19 executed at the gallows, one man pressed to death, and at least four people died in prison. This is a tremendous number from a village with a population of around 500 families. So, not everybody who was accused died. You saw about 150 people died. Sounds like uh, 24 to 30 people died? I, I don't know. That's like a 1 in 5 chance of uh, you surviving when you're accused of being a witch. That's Those are not good odds, no. By the fall, sentiment was beginning to change, and villagers even began to question the guilt of some of the accused. There are stories of torture being used to force some to admit to being a witch, it had also become evident that the way to escape execution was to admit to being a witch. In October, Governor Phipps stopped any further arrests, and those still in prison were eventually released. In the years following the trials, a few participants apologized for their roles, and the village tried to move away from its past. So I have four locations in the game, which are real-life locations. Salem Prison. Those accused of witchcraft were questioned and sent to the local prison. During examination, the suspected witches would be taken from the prison in the morning and brought to the meeting house. At night, they were returned to the prison and kept in chains. Conditions in the prison were far different from what is expected today. The prison was cramped, dirty, and cold in the winter and hot in the summer. The rooms were infested with rats and bugs. Food was meager. Prisoners even had to pay for their food in their chains. The youngest prisoner was four-year-old Dorcas Good, who was so small that special chains had to be constructed for her. Some believed the prisoners were tortured to make them confess. This eventually helped to bring doubts about the validity of the trials. It was believed that the prison walls could not contain the suspected witches as they were reported to transport themselves out of the prison cells and fly through the air at will. Still, the villagers felt the witches could do less harm if they were kept in the prison. The conditions were so grim that at least four people died in prison. Sarah Osborne was among this number. She died on May 10th, 1692. Others suffered health problems later in life. In October 1692, Governor Phipps stated that spectral evidence would no longer be allowed. He stops further arrests and eventually dispels the court. In May 19, 1693, he pardoned all that were still being held in the prison on witchcraft charges. Another location? Salem Common. Today, Salem Common is also called Washington Square, as it was renamed in 1802. This triangular nine-acre park was originally a swampy, undeveloped parcel of land that contained several ponds. During the time of the witch trials and into the following century, the common was used for grazing livestock as well as a location to train the militia. The almshouse, a gun house, and a school building were also located on the common. 
In the early 19th century, the area was filled and graded, making it suitable for planting shrubs and trees. As one of New England's largest common areas, it is still used as a military training area, along with a recreational area and a site where public events are held. The burying ground. Those accused of witchcraft were questioned and sent to the local prison. During examination, the suspected witches would be taken from the prison in the morning and brought to the meeting house. At night, they were returned to the prison and kept in chains. Wait a minute, this is the exact same, uh, this, this, this is the exact same story we had, uh, earlier. That is not, um, okay, let's see. Yeah, hmm, it doesn't look like they have a unique text just for the burying ground. Well, that's sad. That's very sad. Let's talk about the Salem Meeting House instead. In the 17th century, Puritan settlers in most Massachusetts settlements built meeting houses. There were plain buildings constructed of wood with no obvious religious symbols. The meeting house served as the place for both religious and civil meetings. In 1672, Salem Village sought to build their own meeting house separate from the one in Salem Town. An old pulpit was donated from Salem Town, and it was from this position, elevated above everyone else, that the minister preached. The meeting house was the center of a town's activities. This is where the examinations of the accused witches took place. The reason why the, the person was elevated to talk to the crowd was simply because they didn't have microphones back then. There weren't any speakers or anything. Somebody had to actually be high up in the air so their voice could carry to everyone in the building. So let's look at these characters. Tutuba. Tutuba is believed to be an Indian slave whom Samuel Paris purchased while in Barbados. Some of her duties likely included caring for the children of the household. During her time with the girls, it is often believed she told them stories of folk magic. However, this is only a theory and not confirmed in the court records at the time. In the winter of 1692, Betty Paris, Abigail Williams, and Ann Putnam Jr. began showing signs to began showing signs that the local doctor claimed to be from witchcraft. The girls named Tatuba, Sarah Good, and Sarah Osborne as their tormentors. The three women were questioned and sent to prison. Tatuba is the only one of the three to confess to witchcraft. There's been speculation as to whether Samuel Paris forced Tatuba to confess. After confessing, Tatuba accused other villagers of witchcraft. She remained in prison until she was sold to a new master in 1693, who bought her for the price of her prison bill, which was around seven pounds. It was believed, it's believed that she then traveled to Virginia with her new master. We don't know what happened to her next. George Burroughs was born in England and came to Massachusetts at a young age. After graduating from Harvard, he entered the ministry. He served as minister for Salem Village for two years in the early 1680s. He was arrested on May 4th, 1692 and brought back to Salem uh, while he was serving as a minister at Wells. Burrow survived through Indian attacks while living in Maine and first accused of witchcraft by another survivor of the attacks. Some accused him of being the ringleader of the Salem witches. He is strong for his size and exaggerations of his strength were brought up at his trial to tie his strength to the devil and witchcraft. At his execution, he recited the Lord's Prayer perfectly, something that was believed to be possible only by the innocent. Yet Cotton Mather, who attended the execution, made a statement to the crowd that even Satan could transform himself into an angel of light, and thus George Burroughs was executed. Even the devil can cite scripture to suit his own purposes, as the saying goes. Let's take a look at Judge Samuel. Judge Samuel Seawall was a wealthy businessman who emigrated from England as a young man. As a respectable member of the colony, Samuel Seawall was appointed by the new governor, William Phipps, to serve as one of the justices on the court of Oyer and Terminer, established to hear witchcraft cases. After the trials ended, he suffered from guilt for his role and a few years later apologized for his involvement. He was the only judge to apologize. Betty Paris, full name Elizabeth. Betty Paris was the nine-year-old daughter of Ren Reverend Samuel Paris. Betty and her cousin Abigail Williams are often said to have listened to Tatuba's stories about folk magic. A fictionalized element that has been added to the story over the years is that the girls began to experiment with fortune-telling themselves by suspending an egg white in water-filled clear glass to learn the identity of their future husbands. One of these experiments was said to have gone wrong and led to the girls' afflictions. However, it is no evidence that they ever took part in these experiments. Many researchers have tried to explain what really happened and what may have happened to the girls. Could it have been ergot poisoning and, 
and uh, oh, an encephalitis epidemic. Delinquent adolescents are another possibility that has been studied recently would be reactions of stress from frequent Indian attacks a few years earlier. Say somebody has PSTD from those attacks. Uh, during the winter of 1692, Betty and Abigail were the first two girls to show signs of being afflicted. Soon afterwards, they named Tatuba, Sarah Good, and Sarah Osborne as their tormentors. In March, Betty's family sent her to live with the Sewell family in Salem Town in order to get her away from the spotlight of the trial. So, she lived with the judge. Hmm. Anne. Anne Putnam Jr. She was 12 years old during the witch trials. She was one of the most vocal of the afflicted girls, accusing 62 people during the trials, 11 of which were executed. Her involvement began in February 1692 when she first suffered from the same afflictions as Beth Paris. Thomas Putnam, Anne's father, was one of the main instigators of accusations against suspected witches. Therefore, he has been identified as a manipulator of his daughter's testimony. The three women first accused of witchcraft represent the characterizations of the villages that continued through the trials. Sarah Good had been previously suspected of witchcraft and was therefore not a highly respected member of the community. Sarah Osborne was involved in a legal battle with the accuser's family, and Tatuba linked the incident to scars from the Indian Wars. Anne's parents both died seven years after the trials, leaving her to raise nine younger siblings. She never married, but dedicated her life to her family. In 1706, she asked for forgiveness before the church. Anne was the only one of the afflicted girls to apologize. Let's look at Thomas Putnam. Uh, the game made him out to be a villain? Let's hear the truth. Thomas Putnam was a third-generation native of Salem, whose daughter Anne was one of the afflicted girls, with his daughter not being old enough to officially press charges against those whom she accused of tormenting her. Thomas Putnam and three other prominent village men sought the arrest warrants. He also wrote several of the depositions of the afflicted girls. Many of those suffering afflictions or giving testimony against the accused were either connected to Thomas Putnam through family ties or personal connections. Thus, he is often seen as likely having a hand in the process of the trials, but there's no proof he ever told the girls who to accuse. There's no real indication of a rivalry between Putnam and any of the Porter family. There's also no indication that he sought to accuse individuals for his personal gain. As he was not a judge, he did not take personal action in prosecuting or executions of suspected witches. Putnam, as with the other villagers, likely feared that the devil's minions were trying to take over the village. And the final person we have is Bridget, Bridget Bishop. Bridget Bishop was in her late 50s at the time of the witch trials. She had always been a somewhat free-thinking and independent woman. She also had been, she had also been arrested before for fighting with her husband and in 1680 was accused of witchcraft. A warrant for Bridget's arrest on the charges of witchcraft was issued on April 18th, 1692. Beyond the spectral evidence from the tormented girls, several others testified against her. On the 2nd of June, Bridget was the first person tried in witchcraft trials. Eight days later, she became the first person executed as a witch. Okay, so that's uh, a bit of historical information about the Salem Witch Trials. In case you're curious about the Salem Witch Trials, that's a lot of uh, real-life information brought to you by National Geographic on what actually happened. Were they witches? Were they dabbling with witchcraft? Well, considering that it's over 300 years ago, it's going to be really hard to prove something one way or another. 